right, good evening tonight. Glad to be back in church tonight. Let's go ahead and start. We'll take the Psalter tonight. I think we'll be in that all night as far as the uh, congregational singing. So the small white book there, and we'll turn to number 35. Number 35, is that the right one? No, let's go to, what were you playing? You were playing the other one. Let's go to number 41. We'll do 35 later. Number 41. Where the soul never dies. We'll sing the other one later. It's a good one too, I think. Where the soul never dies. Let's stand together. Number 41 in that Psalter. Here we go. To Canaan's land I'm on my way Where the soul singing he needs uh he needs some help here all right so i need a volunteer doug i see that hand all right for the brian i see that hand and john okay here we go for the bruce you join in too here we go verse four now if you can sing that bottom line there if you can men verse number four i'm on my way to that fair land where the soul time that was good you guys that was a blessing i i like volunteering telling people to do what to what to do here we go let's sing that course one more time let's, let's uh, ashley's gonna sing it too I, she, I, she volunteered just now too here we go you sing that bottom line try it again now we'll sing the top line ready on the chorus no sound on this Sunday evening. We had some nice sunshine this afternoon. That was rare. And here this morning, I did it to myself. I said in the service, I said, everybody here that lost electric has gotten electric back. And I know the Heigleys were here this morning and they were the last ones. Uh, Alicia said right when they came in the door, Joel had texted her and said, we got our electric back. I went home after church and guess what? We had no electric in our house. 
And uh, with a little bit of a panic there because Ruth is on, is on oxygen and that requires that plus the temperature. But uh, we called them up within 30 minutes. They had us all set. The neighbors were out too, so we got it all going. But I thought that was funny. The storm's over, it's passed, and now it's sunny, and now we lose our electricity. But at the Leafly House, that's just the way things usually work out. So uh, glad, to, glad we got it going and glad to be here tonight. Let's go to the Lord together in prayer. Father, we love you tonight, and we do thank you, God, for your goodness to us, for your blessings, for your watch care over us. And God, we are so forgetful, Lord, just to watch for your watch care over us and to notice it. And Lord, I pray you'd make us more mindful of those things. We thank you for this Sunday evening, these open doors, this place we have to worship and to meet tonight. God, we pray that you'd bless us as we sing praises to your name. Father, may it please you uh, to hear praise coming your way. And Lord, may, they come from, may it come from our, not just our tongues, but God, hearts of sincerity. Uh, Lord, that we can thank you for all that you've done for us. Bless our time together in the service tonight, we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you. You may be seated. Let's turn back to number 35 there. Number 35 in the Psalter. <clears throat> I've a home beyond the river. Number 35. <clears throat> You'll notice, fellas, there's a couple lines on the chorus there as well. I'm going to sing the top line mostly, but uh, Pastor will be singing the bottom line. You listen for him. You join in on that, okay? Number 35, we'll sing all five verses tonight. <clears throat> Number 35, let's sing together. Oh, the blessed contemplation when with sing the bottom line this time. Here we go. Verse number two. Just a little more to labor. Tell the story. Watch and pray. Just a few more earthly sorrows. Then to heaven we'll fly Oh, 
Wednesday night, we always read the letters from the missionaries, that, or not read the letters, but give you a, a summary of the letters that we get from the missionaries. And this past Wednesday, uh, we got one from Caleb and Abby Robinson. They are our missionaries to Zambia, Africa. We also have the Dobbins over there. But they're a young couple getting ready to go for the first time. They have been raising their support for the last couple of years and uh, are now ready to leave this month to go over to Zambia. Uh, one thing they've run into is they've had, and we mentioned it Wednesday night, uh, they've had all kinds of New Testaments and the Book of Romans and Gospel tracts all printed up to take over there with them, but it costs money to do that. And uh, we have been blessed with that one category, that thing about money, uh, here at the church. And, and so uh, we had our deacons meeting on Thursday morning, and Brother Matthews, of course, loves reading the missionary prayer letters, and he read through that and looked at that letter and saw that need and said, what could we at Bible Baptist Church do about it? So the deacon, our deacon meeting together, uh, we agreed to submit to you as the church that we help them with that cost by sending them $1,000 uh, to help toward the $5,000 it's going to take them to get all of that material shipped over. What a, what, a, what a great honor it would be for us to have a part of that, getting all that stuff shipped over. So that requires you giving your approval of that and so I'm going to ask you tonight if you would be uh, in favor of us from our, this isn't from our missions account. Um, we don't talk about this a lot, but every, every month at our deacons meeting, whatever we have in our, uh, in our account over our monthly budget, we take and put in our reserve account. And that's the money we use to, to build the building out there we're building for different needs. We sent $1,000 to another missionary last month from that. This would be out of that fund also. And that fund, I'll, let, let me just say this without getting too detailed, it's abundant, all right? We've got money we, I hate to say it this way because it's dangerous to say, we need to find places to give away our money. Now don't everybody volunteer at once and raise your hand. I, I know how that goes. But we do need to look for missionaries, things like that, that we can start using that money for because we don't want to uh, we don't want to sit on it too long. We need to have it because we have needs around the church. But at the same time, we don't want it to get too high. We want to give it. So looking for opportunities like this is, uh, is what? Now, the problem, we're on live stream. See, and somebody hears that, and tomorrow I get all kinds of letters in the mail of people that need that money. That's all there is to it. But we're looking at our missionaries that are already supported by Bible Baptist Church and on the walls, and so that's what we're looking for. But uh, we'd like to help the Robinsons with that money by sending that to them to help them ship their tracks and things over there. Everyone in favor of doing that, please write, raise your right hand. All right, Bruce, your right hand, yeah. I... <laughs> All right, all right, you can put your hands down. I don't think there's anybody that would be against it, but even if you were, you're greatly overruled, so it won't really matter, so we won't embarrass you by having you raise your hand. I'm sure there wasn't anyways, but uh, we will do that this week. We'll send that off to the Robinsons. Now, having said that, that our missions, that that reserve account has money that we're looking to help other people with, now we come to our missions account, and that's what the missions offering is for tonight. This is strictly for the support of our missionaries. It's a different fund completely. And as you know, we voted a couple of months or a couple of weeks ago, uh, starting this month, to raise all of our missionaries from $75 a month to $100 a month. So that's another $1,175 obligation. And so we encourage you to give. We had a snow Sunday last month that took us down. We had some low attendance on Sunday. So we're really encouraging you to give toward missions so we can continue to support these missionaries and also to be able to afford that increase that we just gave them a pay raise. That's a blessing too for us that we're able to do that. And so uh, think of that tonight if you would and plan on Sunday nights to give what you can uh, to missions. This is above our tithe and offering from Sunday morning and just something that we want to we want to give so that the, the gospel can get around the world. All right, let's bow our heads and pray. Uh, Pastor Braden's going to lead us in prayer, then we'll take our missions offering. Lord, we are grateful, Father, for the blessings that you've given to us and in, uh, in this county and, and in this country even. Lord, we thank you for uh, missionaries that are worth sending money to, Lord, and I pray, God, that you'd bless each one of them. Lord, they're out every day passing out tracts. They're praying for their, uh, for their nations and the countries where they're at. Lord, they are remembering us in prayer, and they're doing what they're doing in the name of Jesus Christ. And Lord, I pray that you'd bless them as they give out the gospel each and every day. God, please, uh, may this be a blessing to them, and may our church be a blessing to them. Father, thank you, Lord. You said that uh, there is that withholdeth, 
and, uh, and yet has nothing. And Lord, everything we, we keep doesn't amount to anything in eternity, but you said there's that something that gives and then it brings forth abundantly. Lord, so help us, Father, to realize that the greatest blessing is in the, the giving. You said it is more blessed to give than to receive. Lord, uh, I know that the angels, Father, you'd put the angels on half ration for a missionary, for a servant that is giving the gospel. And so, Lord, I pray that you'd please help us to get in on what you're doing. And Lord, please, uh, please bless the transference of this money, even as it goes from, from us to the church and from the church to these countries. Lord, may not a penny of it be lost needlessly. Father, please keep it out of the hands of, of wicked men, out of corrupt government officials, and even out of the uh, even out of the twisted banking system, Lord, I pray that you just help it all to go to the glory of God. In Jesus' name, amen. Things going on this week. Tomorrow, Monday, is the Southeast Ohio Preachers Fellowship. And uh, that will be held at uh, Denny's Restaurant. That's open to anybody that wants to come. Uh, it's a preacher's fellowship, and so we have different preachers preaching. But we've had several of our men from the church attend that, so you're welcome to come out. But that will be at 10 o'clock tomorrow. Uh, Evangelist Timothy Quick and Evangelist Ed Hamby will be preaching for us tomorrow. We have one preacher, then we order our lunch, then we have another preacher... Then we come to the highlight. We eat. All right, so that'll all happen tomorrow. That's, uh, that's Monday. Tuesday will be the funeral service for Brother Dave Thompson. That will be here at the church at 11 o'clock in the morning. And so uh, uh, Devaney said that uh, anybody from the church is welcome to come out. There is no graveside. Originally, it was just going to be a graveside uh, funeral. And then because of the snow and the weather, they moved it in here. But it'll just be one service in here. And so if you want to attend, you're welcome to come. Do remember, please help us. There is a sign-up sheet out in the lobby uh, for meals. We want to feed the family. They have a lot of folks coming from out of town. Uh, the two daughters that were here this morning, one of them is from Texas, the other one from uh, Oklahoma, and then they have other family coming in, so we want to be gracious to them and feed them after the service. So ladies and men, uh, if you can help us with something, there's a list there. All you have to do is sign up for a certain... Uh, part of that meal, and we'll take care of that. So help us with that if you can. Wednesday night, our regular service is here at the church, and then uh, Saturday will be our men's prayer breakfast, 12, uh, 9 o'clock in the morning, downstairs in the fellowship hall. About an hour, an hour and a half, we get together for a meal and for some prayer time. So men, come and join us if you can. And then remember, the ladies' luncheon has been moved from this Tuesday to next Tuesday because of the funeral this week. That's all been set up with Denny, so we're okay all those things are, are set up and all right. So I think that takes care of the announcements. So Pastor Braden, come ahead. All right, let's take that Psalter again. We're going to go to page number 32 tonight. Page number 32. Page number 32. Let's stand together tonight just before Pastor comes with the message. The rock that is higher than I. We're going to take verse 3, just the verse, and sing the verse a cappella, and then have you come back in on the chorus. That'll be for verse 3, and, we'll, and verse 1 and 2 just as normal here. Verse, 
Uh, verse number one now, page 32. The rock that is higher than I. Let's sing together. Oh, sometimes the shadows are deep and rough seems the path to the goal and sorrow sometimes how they sweep like tempest down over the soul. Oh, then to the rock let me fly to the rock that is higher than I. Oh, then to the rock let me fly to the rock that is higher than I. Oh, sometimes how long seems the day and sometimes how weary my feet, but toiling in life's dusty way, the rock's blessed shadow, how sweet, oh, then to the rock let me fly. seated tonight. All right. Uh, I, something I failed to do this morning. Brother Jeremy's wife, Crystal, is with us. She was here on Wednesday night. and uh, We announced her then, but I meant to do that this morning for those that were here that didn't know who that was back there, but we're glad to have Crystal up here from Georgia enjoying this wonderful, beautiful Ohio weather. And if that's not enough, Brother Jeremy brought a friend tonight who's from Mexico. Is this your first time to see snow? Or have you seen it before? Okay. All right, seen it that way, but this is, this is a good way to see it. And did I, what's the name again, Brother Jer Mario. Mario, all right. Mario is a co-worker with Brother Jeremy out there, and uh, he ran into him today at Walmart and invited him out here to church to come, so we're glad to have, glad to have Mario with us tonight. And just so you know, we did do a little bit of uh, preventive maintenance tonight. When we got here this evening, uh, the snow on our front ledge out here was just hanging right over that edge, waiting to fall on somebody's head. And so we went out with a broomstick and knocked some of those down and got them off there, and they were very heavy. And if they'd have hit somebody coming down, that would have been dangerous. So I might ask you to do this. Watch yourself when you go out, all right? Get out the front door kind of quickly because there's that Damocles sword hanging right over your head up there. And so be careful of that if you would. All right, uh, let's sing a couple choruses that we usually sing on Sunday night together. Thank you, Lord, for saving my soul. Thank you, Lord, for making me whole. Thank you, Lord, for giving to me thy great salvation so rich and free. Oh, it is wonderful to be a Christian. Oh, it is wonderful to be God's child. Oh, it is wonderful to have your sins forgiven. Oh, 
it is wonderful to be redeemed, justified, forever reconciled. Second John this evening, the second epistle of John, all the way back toward the book of Revelation, just a few pages before it, the book of Second John. As you find your place there tonight, we are going to read the entire book of Second John tonight. The entire book. Maybe we'll have to take turns and read around in a circle or something to get that far. All 13 verses. We're going to try to get through them tonight. Now we've covered the first four, so that's not bad. But we're going to read all 13. And I hope this is not the most Bible reading you've gotten today, all right? Up to this point at uh, the 7, 7.30 at night. I hope you've had more than that today. If not, don't tell anybody that you haven't. Uh, but you're going to get at least 13 verses. You got some this morning from Pastor Braden. Uh, from Hebrews 4 and Ephesians 4 and some other references. But we're also going to look tonight at 2 John. Let's begin in verse number 1 and read all the way through this entire book, all right? The elder unto the elect lady and her children, whom I love in the truth, and not I only, but also all they that have known the truth, for the truth's sake which dwelleth in us and shall be with us forever. Grace be with you. Mercy and peace from God the Father and from the Lord Jesus Christ, the Son of the Father, in truth and love. I rejoice greatly that I found of thy children walking in truth, as we have received a commandment from the Father. And now I beseech thee, lady, not as though I wrote a new commandment unto thee, but that which we have had from the beginning, that we love one another. And this is love, that we walk after his commandments." This is the commandment that as ye have heard from the beginning, ye should walk in it. For many deceivers are entered into the world who confess not that Jesus Christ is come in the flesh. This is a deceiver and an antichrist. Look to yourselves that we lose not those things which we have wrought, but that we receive a full reward. Whosoever transgresseth and abideth not in the doctrine of Christ hath not God. He that abideth in the doctrine of Christ, he hath both the Father and the Son. If there come any unto you and bring not this doctrine, receive him not into your house, neither bid him God speed. For he that biddeth him God speed is partaker of his evil deeds. Having many things to write unto you, I would not write with paper and ink, but I trust to come unto you and speak face to face that our joy may be full. The children of thy elect sister greet thee. Amen. Let's go to the Lord together in prayer. Father, we thank you tonight for this Sunday evening service, for these that have gathered together. And Father, we, we pray that you'd bless the reading of your word. And now, Father, uh, bless the exposition of your word. Uh, Lord, as we search it, as we, as we uh, try to glean from it, Lord, not only its historical accuracy and what it meant to uh, this dear lady to whom John wrote, but, Father, also the truth that you have for us. All things are written for our admonition and for our learning. And so, Father, give us, please, something tonight that would, that would uh, increase our love for you, uh, increase our service to you, increase our love for one another, and increase our awareness, uh, Father, of the false doctrines that are creeping in all around us. Lord, use this short letter to be a blessing to us tonight. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. The second epistle of John is only 13 short verses. It is an epistle written by a man to a woman. Now most ladies would not be surprised that it's a very short letter. Written by a man to a woman. Now if this was a letter written from a woman to a man. Never mind. Alright. It would put Psalms to a test. Yes, 150 Psalms of them there. But anyways, in these 13 verses, we have, we have the counsel that John, uh, the, the disciple of the Lord, is giving to this beloved lady. He calls her an elect lady in verse number 1. We saw this in verse 1 to 4 last, or a couple of weeks ago when we looked at this letter of encouragement. And John wrote to her. Uh, John was the writer. She was the recipient. The reason for the, the writing of the letter, the rejoicing in the letter, verse number 4. We looked at all of that last time. Today that brings us down to verse number 5. And we're going to look at a letter of exhortation. Not just a letter of encouragement, verse 1 to 4, but a letter of exhortation. And I want you to see two things. And I'm kind of giving you the, the outline or spilling the beans before we get there. I want, you to, I want you to notice what John does to this woman. He's already praised her. Uh, for, for loving the truth. 
He's already praised her for raising her children in the fear and the admonition of the Lord. But now as he gives her some exhortation, exhortation is twofold. Exhortation is encouragement and challenge. That's what exhorting. The Bible tells us in Hebrews 10.25 that you and I are to be exhorting one another. That's our key verse for this year, the front of our bulletin this morning. Exhorting one another and so much the more as you see the day approaching. What does it mean to exhort? It means to encourage and to challenge. And so John is going to do both of this thing, these things in this exhortation. He does this first of all. He commends her for her love in verse 5 and 6. He commends her for her love. And then secondly, in verse 7 down to verse number uh, 11, he cautions her to look. Notice in verse 11, or verse 8, he says, look to yourself. So two things that John is doing as he writes to this dear Christian woman, this widow lady and her children, he commends her for her love and he cautions her to look. And that's what we're going to be looking at here together this evening. Notice in verse 5, as he commends her for her love, he said, now I beseech thee, Lady, not as though I wrote a new commandment unto thee, but that which we have had from the beginning, that we love one another. That word beseech is a very strong word in your Bible. It doesn't mean to simply ask. It means to plead with. It means to beg. It's used about 70 times in our Bible, the word beseech or beseeching. Uh, you're most familiar with it probably from Romans chapter 12 and verse number 1. I beseech you therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, wholly acceptable unto God. Paul the apostle was challenging the church at Rome, the, the believers there, to dedicate their bodies, to give them as a living sacrifice to Christ, that everything we do, that Christ might live in us and through us. And he said, I beseech you to do it. Not, not just I'm asking you to do it, I, I wish you would do it. Beseeching means I plead with you to do that. I beg with you to do that. And here he says to this woman, I beseech thee, not as though I wrote a new commandment, but that which we had from the beginning, that we love one another. John is not telling her anything new. He's not telling her anything she doesn't already know. But he's encouraging her to do what she knows is right to do and is already doing. You know, when we come to church, we're not always going to hear something new. In fact, most of the time, we're not going to hear anything new because Solomon said there's nothing new under the sun. We might learn some things in the Bible we hadn't seen before, but there's not going to be any stupendous new truths that we're going to dig out. We are here to remind one another, to encourage one another, to exhort one another, to love one another. And that's what John is writing to this lady. It's not that she's not doing it already, but he's encouraging to continue in keeping that commandment. That we love one another. I beseech thee, not as I wrote a new commandment, but that which we had from the beginning. Now where is that beginning? Well we know that in the beginning God created the heaven and the earth. Genesis chapter 1. But that's not the beginning that John's referring to here. Turn back just a few pages and I know we've done this before but look back at 1 John chapter 1 and verse number 1. When John is referring in his epistle to the beginning he's not going back to the beginning of time. He's not even going back to the beginning of creation. He's going back to the earthly ministry of the Lord Jesus Christ when he first met the Savior. When he was introduced to him and followed him and listened to him and was taught by him. That was the beginning that John's referring to. We see it in 1 John chapter 1 verse number 1. He says, that which is from the beginning which we have heard, which we have seen with our eyes, which we have looked upon and our hands have handled of the word of life. John talks about the beginning is when he was able to touch the Lord Jesus Christ, when he was able to handle him, when he was able to walk with him and be close to him, leaned upon his breast at the Last Supper. That's what John is talking about. Our hands have handled of the word of life. Now, it's not the same, but it is. Our hands can handle the word of life. You're not going to see Jesus Christ physically in this life. <laughs> He's not going to walk into the church building and sit down in here with us. You're not going to meet him on the street. He's not going to appear in a vision to you and come down and speak to you or anything like that. You're not going to see him literally and physically. But your hands can handle the word of life. 
In fact, right now, you're probably doing it because you have a Bible in your hand. And that Bible is the Word of Life. It's, it's not coincidental that Jesus is the Word and the Bible is the Word. Jesus is the Word of God, capital W, in the Bible, and the Bible is the Word of God, small w, in the Bible. Pastor Braden read uh, Hebrews 4.12, the Word of God is quick and powerful and sharper than a two-edged sword. And every time you hold your Bible, you are handling, in essence, you're handling the Word of Life. What a unique privilege we have. What a special honor that we have to hold that book and realize it is the Word of God. And it is the Word of Life. I try to be careful. I don't always do it. You might notice sometimes when I come up and I set my books or my Bibles up here. and him, I try never to set anything on top of this book. And that's not because I worship this book. Don't, don't misunderstand me. I don't bow down and worship this book. But this book has told me everything I know about God. This book has told me everything I know about Jesus Christ, everything I know about Christianity, everything I know about salvation, everything I know about, about right and wrong that is right, I've learned from this book right here. What other source are you going to go to for that information? Who else is going to guide you in all truth? And so you and I are able to handle that word of God, and thank God for that. But John says to this woman in the second epistle, he said, I beseech you that you keep this commandment, which is not a new commandment, but an old commandment, that you love one another. Can I encourage you tonight? Do those things you know are right to do. Look to add the things that you're not doing, but keep a hold of the things that you know are right to do. We're going to see why that's so important when we get down here to verse number 8 in just a few moments. But keep those commandments. Look back, if you would, at the Gospel of John. All right, we're in, we're in 2 John, but look back, turn quite a few pages to the left and go back to the Gospel of John and chapter 13. John chapter 13. In verse number 34, the Lord Jesus Christ says this, A new commandment I give unto you, that you love one another. As I have loved you, that you love one another. By this shall all men know that you're my disciples, if you have love one for another. Notice Jesus said, a new commandment I give unto you. Why is that a, why did he call it a new commandment? Well, the Old Testament had already said, thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, all thy soul, and all thy mind. All right, that's the first and great commandment. The, the law had told us we need to love God. Then it went on, Jesus said the second greatest commandment of the Old Testament was to love thy neighbor as thyself. So the Old Testament taught us to love God and to love our neighbor. Now Jesus threw a real twist in there in Matthew uh, chapter 5 when he said, love your enemies. You know, it's getting tougher. Loving God, that's a challenge. To love God with all your heart, all your soul, and all your mind. And then he said, love your neighbor as yourself. Then he says, and love your enemies. But now Jesus comes along with the instituting of the church. And he says, I want to give you a new commandment. Not just to love God, not just to love uh, your neighbor, not just to love your enemies. But I want you to love one another. I don't know if it's sad that Jesus had to tell his disciples that in the first place. They had to tell Peter, James, and John to love one another. Thomas and Bartholomew, Philip, yeah, I want you to love one another. Maybe he had to tell that because there was sometimes some dissension in the ranks. Some murmuring and complaining. I remember one occasion where the two sons of thunder, uh, their mother wanted uh, to ask Jesus that her two sons, James and John, could sit at the right and left hand of the Lord in his glory. And the other disciples didn't appreciate that. <laughs> didn't like that. There could have been some dissension. Peter, with all his boasting and his bragging of how faithful he'd been to God, maybe the others didn't appreciate that all the time. Is there a possibility of dissension and murmuring and complaining and dislike within the body of Christ? Oh, yes, there is. You've seen it. <laughs> and so he, rem he reminds the woman that from the beginning of Christ's ministry, he added a new commandment, and that is that we love one another. Can I ask you a question this evening? Well, I'm going to. 
How do you treat someone you love? Or maybe I should say it more clearly, how should you treat someone you love? Because we always don't treat the people we love like we love them. We're not always as respectful of those that we love that we, that we should be. Sometimes, I, maybe it's just me, maybe you don't have these problems. But sometimes I th say things that as the words are coming out, I wish I could grab them and yank them and pull them back because those aren't the things I should be saying to someone I love. And so now we take that and employ it in the church. And we are to love one another. As I look around at the congregation tonight, we are to love one another. I have no problem with that. We're all different, different backgrounds, different tastes in some areas and things like that. I look at, I look at Jay and Nicole and all their plank stuff and like that, and I think, what a waste. All right. I'm kidding. They get into that physical stuff and do all that. I, I notice Dustin, he's back here sometimes, posting stuff about trucks and semis and all that stuff, and I don't, I don't have a clue on any of that stuff. But in spite of the things and things like that, we, we love one another. We have, a, we have a connecting bond in the Lord Jesus Christ. And we have a connecting love for him that binds us one to another. Isn't it a blessing? Uh, Brother Jeremy and Brother Billy come up here from, from Florida and from Georgia respectively. And they come in here and they come into church and it's just like they fit right in as part of the family. And if you and I were to go down their direction and go to their churches and go in there, because of our bond in Christ, we just, we just kind of, it doesn't matter where you're from and, and who you are, you just fit in in those things. And that's because we're keeping that commandment that we love one another. And John is encouraging this dear saint of God, this widow woman and her children, encouraging them to, 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 to love one another. Notice what he says in verse number 5. Uh, he says, uh, or verse number 6, excuse me, and this is love that we walk after his commandments. Notice that word walk twice in verse 6. This is the commandment that as you have heard from the beginning, you should walk in it it's not just talk it's walk not just saying it but showing it saying it is not enough even when it comes to our relationship with the Lord Lord I love you Lord I love you I wonder how long till he finally says well show it <laughs> do something prove it we all need to do that so he, the commandment to love, uh, John is commending her for her love. Then secondly, in verse 7, down through verse 11, he cautions her to look. John has established a relationship with this lady on a, on a spiritual plane of praising her in the first four verses, commending her in verse 5 and 6, and now he wants to caution her in verse 7 down through verse 11. Just because you love someone doesn't mean you don't caution them. If you love your kids, you tell them not to stick their fingers in the light, light socket. That's not holding them back. That's not restraining them from their desires. That's protecting them. And because you love them, you caution them. The, John loves this woman, so he cautions her. He says in verse 7, Many deceivers are entered into the world who confess not that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh. This is a deceiver and an antichrist. Many deceivers. This is 2,000 years ago. Many deceivers are entered into the world. Do you think we live in better days than John did? In more spiritually pure days than when John lived in? Look over at Matthew chapter 24, if you would. Matthew chapter 24, if you know your, your, your Bible, Matthew chapter 24 is a future tense verse, a future prophecy. It's talking about a time that is yet future to us right now. It's the other side of the rapture. Matthew 24 and Matthew 25, a lot of folks get confused in these two chapters, but this is, this is after the rapture material. And in Matthew chapter 24, notice what Jesus says in verse number 11. He says, verse 10, well, verse 9, how, do, how far back do you go? Verse 9, they shall deliver you up to be afflicted, they shall kill you, and ye shall be hated of all nations for my name's sake. That's talking about God's remnant 
during the tribulation period following the rapture. He says in verse 10, And then many shall be offended and shall betray one another and shall hate one another, and many false prophets shall rise and shall deceive many. That's a future reference in Matthew 24. John's reference is a past tense ref reference in 2 John. Many deceivers were there then. Many deceivers will be there in the future. What do you think there is right now? There's many deceivers. John gives us some things about these deceivers uh, in this verse. First of all, the declaration that there shall be, that there are many deceivers entered into the world. That's an interesting phrase, isn't it? They are entered into the world. It's like, well, where were they before? What do you mean they're entered into the world? Well, their false teaching has come from someplace outside of this world and not a good spiritual source. So the declaration about these deceivers is that many of them are entered into the world. Folks, right now realize there are many deceivers in the world today. They are not the guys at the pub. They're not the guys at the bar. They're not the guys uh, out there living a, 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 a promiscuous lifestyle. The, the deceivers are in churches. They're behind pulpits. They're preaching sermons or usually sermonettes. And they're deceiving many. They are wolves, the Bible tells us, in sheep's clothing. And many deceivers are out there. And John wants to tell this woman, listen, you have been hospitable. You have loved the brethren. You have taken care of the needs of saints. But I want to warn you that some of the folks that are passing through here are not really who you think they are. And you need to check them out. I think that's a very important truth. John is writing to this older widow woman and holding her responsible for checking out the doctrine of those that she's listening to. You know, those deceivers seem to prey upon that kind of person. What did Jesus say to those Pharisees in Matthew chapter 23? You devour widows' houses. This widow woman, John's warning her, there are many deceivers. He, he, he makes the declaration then he gives the definition in verse number, uh, verse number 7. Who are these deceivers? Ones who confess not that Jesus Christ is come in the flesh. That's the definition of a deceiver. One that confesses not that Jesus Christ is come in the flesh. Now we're going to talk about this in just a moment, so I'll not get ahead of us. But this is something John emphasizes throughout his gospel throughout his first epistle, throughout his second epistle, that Jesus Christ, that, that human being called Jesus, born of Mary the Virgin, was God in a human body. And that is a key doctrine for you and I to believe. If you deny that, you cannot be saved. That's what John told us in 1 John chapter 5, in verse, verse number 1. That if we don't believe that Jesus is the Christ, we have not God. You have to believe he was God manifest in the flesh. And can I tell you this? Many, many, many within Christianity don't believe Jesus Christ was God in a human body. Seminaries are putting out preachers, scholars, doctrinal students that don't believe that Jesus Christ was God. They believe he was a good man. They believe he was a martyr for a good cause. Some of them, and we've studied this before, the Ebionites and the Serinthians back in John's day, believed that, that he was a human being and God came upon him in his baptism, left him in his crucifixion. He's a human being after that. But they don't get the thing that he is the same yesterday, today, and forever. He was God, he is God, and he'll ever be God. And he, John is telling her, you need to watch out for those that don't confess that Jesus Christ is come in the flesh. Some folks say, well, that's just a doctrine, and doctrine divides. Yes, it does, and it should. It should divide the deceivers from the believers. And John is encouraging this woman to put these preachers, she's showing hospitality. Guest preachers are coming through her area. She's putting them up in her home. John's going to talk about that in verse number 10 and 11. She's being hospitable to them, but John's saying you need to check them out before you're hospitable to them. You need to make sure they hold the right doctrine especially when it comes to Christ. John's great emphasis is on the deity and humanity of Christ. He would condemn those who say this, and tell me if you've ever heard this, all religions are worshiping the same God just by a different name. 
We've had presidents say that. We've had religious leaders declare that. And can I say, that's a lie from the pit of hell. We are not all worshiping the same God. You know what the key to that is? Jesus Christ. What other religion has a God that has a son that died on a cross to redeem those that believed in him? Absolutely none. Christianity is an exclusive religion. Don't, don't apologize for that. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. Muslims don't acknowledge Jesus Christ as the way, the truth, and the life. Buddhists don't. Shintos don't. All, all these other different religions that are out there, none of them acknowledge that. Christ is the key, and John's going to talk about that just a little bit more here. But notice, the declaration, many deceivers are entered into the world, the definition of a deceiver, those that confess not that Christ has come in the flesh, and then the description of the deceiver at the end of verse 7, this is a deceiver and an antichrist. They have a dual role. They're a deceiver and an antichrist. Why does John use two different words? A deceiver is the enemy of man. The Antichrist is the enemy of God. Those that are out there preaching a false gospel are deceiving people. There are religions today that are deceiving people. Whether it's the cults, whether it's the charismatics, whether it's the Catholics, whatever it might be, when they don't teach that Jesus Christ is God and the only way to salvation... He is the only way to salvation. It's through Him. When they teach any other thing, they're a deceiver. And many folks are believing all kinds of other things, the Mormons, the Jehovah Witnesses, all that kind of stuff. And John is being very, very narrow-minded right here. And he says, there are those that are, that are the enemies of truth, they're deceivers, they're the enemy of man, and they're antichrist, they're the enemy of God. John is the only one in the Bible that uses that, that, that term, antichrist, and he's referring to it at this, at this sense, that those are those that deny that Christ has come in the flesh. So he tells her in verse number 8, because of this, he said, look to yourselves. In other words, examine the others, make sure they're in the doctrine of Christ, but then look to yourself. Why? That we lose not those things which we have wrought. Here is a Christian woman, a godly woman, raised her children for the Lord. In her later years, showing hospitality to other Christians that passed through, giving them a place to stay, giving them meals, taking care of them. And John says, if you're not careful, dear lady, if you're not careful and you don't look to yourself, you could lose a reward. He says in verse number 8, Look to yourselves that we lose not those things which we have wrought, but that we receive a full reward. Did you know that as a Christian there's some things you can lose? As a Christian, that's what he, look to yourself. Tolerating this false doctrine, tolerating this anti-Christian sentiment, John says to her, you can lose something if you're not careful. What can you lose as a Christian? You can lose your testimony. You know how frail your testimony is? You can spend years building up your testimony, living a good, a Christian life as a believer after being saved, living a Christian life, being faithful to God, serving God, going to church, doing everything you're supposed to do, praying, reading your Bible. And then for one reason or another, and the real reason behind it is that deceiver and antichrist, for one reason or another, you come to a point in your life where you decide, I'm not going to do this anymore. Or you go out and you just, you have a temptation that you slip up in and you do, and you can lose your testimony. We all know of some believer in Christ that served God faithfully for years, who when their name is called now, is not smiled upon. I know of fellow preachers that I have fellowshiped with and loved and preached with that today I no longer can smile when their name's mentioned because they gave in to some kind of sin or temptation that ruined their ministry and ruined their life. You can lose your testimony. Be careful not to do that. Be careful to guard it. You can lose your health. 
The Bible tells us in 1 Corinthians chapter 11 when Paul was talking to the church there about the Lord's Supper, he said, for this reason many are weak and sickly among you. Some of the believers at the church at Corinth were participating in things and doing things that were not favorable and approved of God, and for that they suffered ill health. Now please don't take that and run. That doesn't mean everybody that, that gets sick is because of judgment of sin. There's some deceivers that even go that route. But it does mean that sometimes the sickness can be due to disobedience to God. You can lose your health. In fact, for this cause many are weak and sickly among you, and many sleep. Now that didn't mean the sleep you got this afternoon before you came back to church. That means they died. Believers died for transgressing God in some area of their life, and they lost their lives for it. That happens today. We just don't see the announcements. We don't find it on the news. We don't know when that's the reason for it. But you can lose your, your life. You can lose your inheritance. You can lose your assurance of salvation. When you're not living right, you question whether you're really saved. When you're not, when you're not doing what is pleasing to God, you wonder, am I really a child of God? You can lose your assurance. You can lose your joy. You can lose your... Uh, you can lose your peace. You can lose a whole lot of things. But thank God there's one thing you cannot lose. And that's your membership in the family of God. Look at John. Go back to John chapter 10, the gospel of John. Look at John chapter 10. And this again is where some folks get mixed up. They think you can lose this one too. And if you could lose this, God has no power. You can lose your testimony, your rewards, your health, your joy, your inheritance, your, insur uh, your assurance, but you can't lose your salvation. <laughs> Once you're in, you're in. John chapter 10, you know the verses. Verse number 27 of John chapter 10, Jesus said, My sheep hear my voice. He's talking about his disciples. He's not talking about some, some unnamed or unknown group here. He's talking about those that are following him. My sheep hear my voice, and I know them, and they follow me. He says in verse 28, And I give to them eternal life. Notice the words very, it's not, and I will give to them eternal life. He said, and I give to them. Those sheep that were following him at that time, he said, I give to them eternal life. Now, correct me if I'm wrong, but I know I'm not, eternal means everlasting. It means never going to go away. If something's eternal, God is eternal. <laughs> From beginning to the end, Alpha Omega, God is eternal. He's never going to not be here. He never was not here. He's eternal. Your salvation is eternal. It's not temporary. It's not probationary. Thank God for that. God gave us eternal life, and he said, now as long as you toe the line, you can keep this, but if, if you don't, I'm taking it back. We'd all have forfeited a long time ago. He said, I give to them eternal life, and they shall never perish. That's a promise from God. They shall never perish. You know, folks, I've talked to folks sometimes that, that, that are of this persuasion that if you don't do right, you can lose your salvation. Now, that's a terrible affront to God. Because you were saved by the grace of God, by the death of Christ on Calvary, not by anything you did or did not do. So if you are given salvation by grace, you must then be kept by grace. Because you can't get it by grace and then keep it by works. That, doesn't, that just doesn't fit the formula. And someone says, well, I believe you can lose your salvation. Well, what, what, what do you have to do to lose your salvation? Well, if you do this, 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 or the other thing, and then they look at folks like us and say, well, if you believe you can't lose it, you'll go out and do this, this, and the other thing. I've been saved 47 years. I haven't done this, that, or the other thing because I don't desire to do that, this, that, or the other thing. I'm not worried about that. And yet folks that worry about losing their salvation seem to struggle with this, that, and the other thing. It's all around backwards. Jesus said, I give to them eternal life, and they shall never perish, neither shall any man pluck them out of my Father's hand. When you got saved, you think all state has good hands? You've seen the commercial. When you got saved, you got put into the hands of God. Who in the world is mighty enough to get you out of the hand of God? 
Somebody says, well, no man, but the devil can. Well, you know, God told the devil back in Ezekiel chapter 28, thou art a man and no God. So even that man can't pluck you out of the hand. Oh, well, I could fall out myself out of the hand of God. You haven't been reading your Bible. You don't know what the hand of God's capable of doing. I mean, just his little tiny finger created the universe. And so God is, or, or John is telling this lady, look to yourself that you do not lose any of these things, but that we receive a full reward. The Lord told us back in the Gospel of Luke to lay up treasure in heaven. And that's what we're attempting to do right now. We're not living good lives so we can get to heaven. We're living good lives so we can get rewarded when we get to heaven. And we can lose those rewards if we're not careful. We can lose those rewards if we don't guard ourselves. And so he says in verse number 8, look to yourselves that you lose not those things that you have wrought, but that we receive a full reward. Apparently, compromising on the doctrine of Christ can cause you to lose a full reward. Even if you're saved, to accompany those to assist those that don't have the right doctrine of Christ, you can lose a reward. John is being very vehement in his exhortation. Check out their doctrine. Notice it says in verse number 9, Whosoever transgresseth and abideth not in the doctrine of Christ hath not God. He that abideth in the doctrine of Christ hath both the Father and the Son. If there come unto you any that bring not this doctrine... That doesn't fit into our Laodicean church age today. That doesn't fit into our contemporary churches where they're sacrificing doctrine on the altar of being more accepted. Churches will take the name Baptist off of their church. This has been going on for decades now. They'll take the name Baptist off of their church because they believe that that's pinning them, pinholing them into a certain location. That if people know they're Baptist and they're categorizing them as something. I don't know about you, I don't have a problem with that. Being categorized as a Baptist means, I believe, in biblical authority, the autonomy of the church. We went through that a little while ago, the B-A-P-T-I-S-T. We go, that, that defines what we are. And the, and the trend now is to, you know, take a Temple Baptist of Detroit is now the river. Well, what, what does that mean? It means you have no idea what they believe. It means you have no idea what they stand for. And uh, there are churches that, that people teach all different kind of things in the same church to accommodate everybody in there of all the different persuasions. That's what John's talking about right there. You cannot transgress the doctrine of Christ. To do that is to lose your soul. The doctrine of Christ. Of all the things that you believe or don't believe, the most essential and the most vital is the doctrine of Christ. What is the doctrine of Christ? Well, it's his eternity. That he, uh, John said it in John chapter 1 verse 1, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. John went through great extremes in his writing to show us that that person, that human, was the eternal God. In the beginning... God created the heaven and the earth. That God was manifest in three persons, the Father, the Son, the Holy Ghost. And to deny that is to deny the salvation of your soul. Because that's the doctrine of Christ, that he is eternal. We also, the doctrine of Christ also includes his incarnation. Write down the reference if you would. We won't have time to turn to all these. But 1 Timothy chapter 3, verse 16. His incarnation. It's not only his eternity, but his incarnation. 1 Timothy chapter 3, verse 16, And without controversy, great is the mystery of godliness. God was manifest in the flesh. Those are some strong words. God was manifest in the flesh. When? In whom? If it wasn't Jesus Christ, where was it? Because the Bible says that God was manifest, made known. Made known in the flesh. The Bible tells us in Philippians that he was made in the likeness of man. His incarnation. 
that when Mary gave birth that day, that baby she held in her hands was none other than the eternal God. Many deny that. Many question that. But you can't question that and be in the doctrine of Christ. There's his eternity. There's his incarnation. There's his sinlessness. His sinlessness. 1 John chapter 3, we're right there. Look back one, one or two pages. 1 John chapter 3, verse 5. First John 3, 5. John said this, and you know that he was manifested. There's that manifestation. He was manifested to take away our sins, and in him is no sin. He was the spotless Lamb of God. He was without, his blood was without spot or blemish. There was no sin in him. Folks like Hollywood likes to come out with these movies about him and Mara or Marthy or so, somebody, one of those other women and accuse him of this or that. That's blasphemy. Don't put up with that. Don't tolerate Jesus Christ superstar. That's a bunch of, that's a bunch of filth and nonsense. Jesus Christ was sinless. He was tempted in all points like as we, the Bible says, yet without sin. And to deny that, that he was sinless, is to deny the doctrine of Christ. The doctrine of Christ is many faceted. His eternity, his incarnation, his sinlessness. How about his atonement? 1 Peter 2.24. 1 Peter 2.24. I've got to turn because my mind's going blank as I try to quote it right now. 1 Peter 2.24. Who his own self bear our sins in his own body on the tree. That we being dead to, that we being dead to sin. No, I'm quoting a different verse. Who his, own, who his own self bear our sins in his own body on the tree. That we being dead to sin should live under righteousness by whose stripes we are healed. He bore our sins in his body on the tree. That's why we don't need a pastor or a priest, or a preacher, or a church, or some sacraments, or ordinances to go to heaven. Because none of those things died on a cross for our sins. And to substitute any of those things for the sinless, spotless Son of God is an affront to Jesus Christ. He is the truth, the way, and the life. Not, not anything else. And John tells us that the doctrine of Christ includes his atonement. Not only that, but number five, his bodily resurrection. To believe in Christ, you have to believe. To have the doctrine of Christ, you've got to believe in his bodily resurrection. Luke chapter 24 and verse number 39, all the way back in the Gospel of Luke. Chapter 24 and verse 39. I would not read these verses just to hurry up, but I learned with Pastor Lewis this morning that you don't care if it goes long. <laughs> Chapter 24, verse 39. I mean that as a compliment to everybody. Chapter 24, verse 39. Notice what Jesus said. Behold my hands and my feet. This is after his resurrection. Behold my hands and my feet, that it is I myself. Handle me and see, for a spirit hath not flesh and bones, as you see me have. You know the doctrine of Christ is under such attack? In all these different areas, his eternity, his incarnation, his sinlessness, his atonement, his bodily resurrection. Oh, well, he didn't rise as a body, he rose as a spirit. Well, he said, he said to Thomas in John chapter 20, Stick your finger in the hole of my, stick your finger in the, the nail prints of my hands. Stick your hand in the, the, the spear print in my side and see that it, that, it is, that it is I. He was a physical, literal body. He sat down and ate fish with the men by the fire there. He said, handle me, see me, test me, for a spirit hath not flesh and bones. It was a bodily resurrection. The cults and many of the others teach that it was a spiritual resurrection and so his return will be a spiritual return and that brings me to number six and that is his return. The doctrine of Christ, his eternity, his incarnation, his sinlessness, his atonement, his bodily resurrection and his return, all of these are key. All of these come under the heading of the doctrine of Christ. So for a church to say we don't teach doctrine, you might as well fold up, close your doors, go home. There's no purpose for you to meet. 
Because all these things are necessary for your soul's salvation. You've got to trust this Christ. If you don't believe in his bodily resurrection, his atonement, his sinlessness, his incarnation, your profession of faith really was in vain. Now, I know that might sound harsh, but it's truth. His return. Acts chapter 1. You know the verse. He's ascending up to heaven after his resurrection, his bodily resurrection. In Acts chapter 1 and verse 10, they're watching him ascend up to heaven. And while they looked steadfastly toward heaven as he went up, behold, two men stood by them in white apparel, which also said, Ye men of Galilee, why stand ye gazing up into heaven? This same Jesus, which is taken up from you into heaven, shall so come in like manner as you have seen him go into heaven. That physical resurrection and physical ascension guarantees a physical return one of these days. And to not believe in a Christ that's coming back is not to believe in the Christ of the Bible. And for someone to say we're all worshiping the same God and ignore all these things about Christ is not the God of the Bible. And John warns this woman about this doctrine of Christ and says, if anybody comes to your house and they don't have that doctrine, don't take them in. Don't accept them. Examine them. Know what they believe. That's the charge to a widow woman back in that day. Someone says, well, you know, preacher, I just, I'm not a preacher, so I don't know the Bible. Shame on you. You're supposed to know the Bible. You're supposed to know these doctrines. That's why we come to church. That's why we read our Bible. That's why we, why we come to Sunday school and Sunday night and Wednesday night and, and to learn all these things. That's why we go book by book through the Bible, through the book of Acts, through James, 1st, 2nd, and 3rd, uh, 1st, 2nd Peter, 1st, 2nd, and 3rd John, Jude. That's why we go through these. So we get the Bible under our belt so we can test the spirits, whether they be of God. And so John warns this woman to do that. His return, a couple other references I didn't mention yet. You know them, John chapter 14. In my Father's house are many mansions. I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go to prepare a place for you, I will come again, Jesus said, and receive you unto myself. 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, beginning in verse 16. The Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel, the trump of God, the dead in Christ shall rise first. We which are alive and remain shall be gathered together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. So shall we be, ever be with the Lord. The Bible is full of examples that Christ came the first time and he's coming the second time. And that's all the doctrine of Christ. And John tells this dear lady, make sure they have not, make sure they have that, got that doctrine of Christ because he that abideth not in the doctrine of Christ hath not the Father and if not the Son. If you don't worship the Son, you're not worshiping the Father. You can't have Jehovah without Jesus Christ. Jesus himself told that, told those, Phari those, those Pharisees that. You ha he, if you don't acknowledge the, the Son, you don't have the Father. So the doctrine of Christ is a vital thing. So he tells her now in this exhortation, here's what happens. Verse number 10. If there come any unto you, and bring not this doctrine, receive him not into your house. No welcome. This woman given to hospitality. We're to be given to hospitality. The Bible tells us to. We're to be hospital, uh, hospital, yeah, hospitable one to another. But when it comes to these folks with a false doctrine, he says, she, he, he tells her, don't let them come into your house. Now, we apply that with the folks that are going around knocking on doors these days. But John's simply talking about this woman that was showing her hospitality to these guest evangelists and preachers coming through. And he said, you, you check them out. Make sure they've got the doctrine of Christ right before you let them into your house. No welcome. No well-wishing. Look at the end of the verse. Neither bid him God speed. Don't tell those folks God bless you. Because God's not going to bless them if they're deceivers. God's not going to bless them if they're antichrists. So John gives her this warning. He says in verse 11, For he that biddeth him Godspeed is partaker of his evil deeds. Be careful with a God bless you. <laughs> I've, had, I've, I've gotten in conversations with people of different religious backgrounds or persuasions. 
And simply because I'm a Christian or a minister or whatever, at the end of the conversation, we'll say, well, God bless you. And it's supposed to require me to say to them, yes, and God bless you too, but I can't do that. So I could say, well, have a day. I didn't say nice. I didn't say bad. But have a day. The Bible says not to bid them God speed. And that's exactly what that means. Don't say God bless you to somebody that God's not going to bless. That's living, teaching a doctrine contrary to the doctrine of Christ. And, and John is exhorting her. Exhorting her to do that. All right, quickly. It was a letter of encouragement, verse 1 to 4. A letter of exhortation, verse 5 to 11. And then finally, a letter of expectation, verse 12 to 13. And I've got to fit this in now because it's not enough for a whole sermon next Sunday night. So it's a letter of expectation. Notice what John says in verse 12. Having many things to write unto you, I would not write with paper, <laughs> I like this, I would not write with paper and ink. If John was living in our day, he said, having many things, I would not call you on the telephone. I would not send you an email. I would not text you. I would not connect you on Facebook Messenger. I would not tweet you or twiddle you or paddle you or whatever, whatever the other, all the other things, whatever they are out there. He said, he said, I would not do that. He said, but I would not write with paper and ink, but I trust to come to you and speak face to face. I like that method. I like that process. Now, we have to use the other sometimes. We all know that. I, I, I say that lightheartedly. We have to use texting and emails and different occasions and stuff. In fact, John said, I would not write with paper and ink just as he got done writing with paper and ink. So he's not saying he couldn't do it, but he said, if I had my way, if I had my desire, it wouldn't be to communicate in an impersonal way, but to see you face to face. Isn't that, isn't that something in our day and time that that would, ha that would be such a thing? You've seen it. You've gone into Denny's, to a restaurant, seen four people sitting at the table, and all of them. And then you find out one of them is actually talking to the one sitting across from them, but not verbally, right here. I think one of these days, fingers are just going to rot and fall off. All thumbs and fingers, just, just consuming that. We, we have, our society has lost a personal touch. I, now I, could, I can get off on a whole other sermon. I can spend another hour on this one right here. We've lost the personal touch. The face to face. Paul said it. We saw it in Acts this morning. If you remember, we were in Acts chapter 20. As he was leaving Miletus, uh, as he had gre greeted the people from Ephesus, and as they escorted him to the ship, they weep because he'd said that they, that they that would see his face no more. That face to face encounter, that's what's so important. You know how you got saved? A face to face with Jesus Christ. No, you didn't see him, but the Holy Ghost of God worked in your heart and revealed him to you, and you trusted Christ as your Savior. And the best method, the best method, <laughs> the best method is face to face. And John says, having many things to write, I would, write, I would not write with paper and ink, but I trust to come unto you and speak face to face that our joy may be full. Back there during the COVID days, a couple of years ago, 2020, when churches were shutting down, and, and some did and had to, and I, this is not the place to go back and judge anybody or anything, but a lot of them went on live stream like we did, and a lot of times they were talking about Zoom meetings. <laughs> well, it's a bad time to preach you about that, isn't it? Pastor Lewis just said we're not doing another one. I sat down at my computer. You guys, you guys were on there for that meeting, and I got in there late. Uh, I forget where I was, but I got in there late and came down and turned my computer on, and I see everybody, and, and everybody's, you know, Brother Lewis is talking, and I'm talking back and talking back and talking back, and nobody's hearing me, and I'm checking everything on that computer, and everybody's thinking, boy, that's, you know, the pastor, he's an older guy, you know, <laughs> computer illiterate, he really doesn't know what he's doing over there, and I'm thinking, that's what everybody's thinking about me, so I told my daughter, I told Aaron, I said, hey, they, nobody can hear me, she said, your, your uh, microphone doesn't work on your computer, so it wasn't my fault. All right, it wasn't there. I'd rather do it face to face. Don't have to worry about the microphone. Don't have to worry about the camera. Don't have to worry about the login. Don't have to worry about the password. Dustin, I don't have to worry about the password. I had to call Dustin last night for a password. You were in church up north, and I had trying to print the bulletins. It just was not cooperating. That's not because I don't know how to do it. 
but I'd rather do it face to face. That's what John's saying. Back in his day, they can do it with paper and ink, but they'd rather do it face to face, that our joy may be full. Uh, I'll say this, folks. I love the live stream. I'm glad Brother Gary can watch us tonight. I'm glad Ruth can watch us tonight. I'm glad Bernie can watch us. I think it's some that I know are watching on there. They can't physically get out here. But you know what? I'd rather have it face to face. <laughs> that's, that's, that's the way the Lord designed it. Because if you, are, if you watch it up there, it's not the same as being here. And I have heard great sermons from great preachers from the past, and I've listened to their audio and listened to them, and I get moved by them, I get, I get stirred by them, but it's not like it was being there. It's always better. It's always better face to face. And John told her, he said, I don't want to write with paper and ink. I want to come and see you face to face that our joy may be full. And he closes in verse 13, the children of thy elect sister greet thee. He sends a greeting for her at the close of his letter of expectation. What? I don't know, but are you amazed? Are you just kind of just in awe of all that's included in 13 verses in that little letter right there? I mean, the preacher has just expounded on the second half. We did the first four verses. But all that is in, you know, how long did it take us to read those, first thir those 13 verses when we first started? No time at all. How much did we exhaust from that? A whole lot. And we didn't get it all. Some other Bible preacher or teacher could come up here and draw stuff from there that we didn't even see tonight. And it would be just as real and true because this word is just unbelievable. Your hands can handle the word of life. <laughs> what are we doing with it? Back in Jesus' day, if they'd seen him physically and could touch him and listen to him and chose not to, man, how foolish that would have been. We can't see him physically right now, but we've got him through his word and how foolish it would be to not take advantage of it. Let's stand tonight with our heads bowed and our eyes closed. Father, we thank you for your word. God, it, it truly is quick and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword. And Father, every time we open your book and read your words, Lord, you speak to us. And we're so thankful for that. We're not worthy, God, that the eternal God of heaven should speak to us. And that, Father, when we read your word, you do exactly that. Your spirit guides us into all truth. You inform us, you educate us, you convict us, you reprove us. And Father, we are in need of that. We pray we take the exhortation given to this dear lady. Father, we would continue in that love. But Father, we'd also have caution to look about us. Father, realize that everything that presents itself as good is not necessarily so. For even the, 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 the deceitful angels are made as ministers of Christ. And Lord, help us to spot that error when it comes to the doctrine of Christ. And to truly know him as our Lord and our Savior. To believe that his death on Calvary was for us, individually and particularly. That we might go to heaven when we die simply by our faith in him. Father, thank you for that free gift of eternal life. Bless us tonight. Encourage us to live more heartily for thee. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Do 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 That's the song I want. What is it? Savior Divine, that's not the name of it. Give us just a moment if you would here, please. 312, there we go, page 312, page 312, may the Lord challenge us tonight simply to heed the advice of John to this dear woman, to continue in our love for him, and to be cautioned for those things that are out there, open my eyes that I may see you, page 312, we'll sing the three verses here. Open mine eyes that I may see.
see glimpses of truth thou hast for me place in my hand the wonderful key that shall unclasp and set me free silently now i wait for thee ready my god thy will to see open mine eyes illumine me spirit divine open my ears that i may hear voices of truth thou sendest clear and while the wave notes fall on my shall disappear. Silently now I wait for thee. Ready, my God, thy will to see. Open my ears, illumine me. Savior divine, dismissed in prayer tonight don't forget ladies if you can or men uh, take a look at that sign up sheet for meals for after the funeral on Tuesday we want to be gracious to the family that has gathered here and so take a look at that if you would brother Bruce if you would sir close us in prayer tonight please <laughs>